Hi there, welcome, welcome. Hey, come right on in. This is Homekeepers. Have you joined us before? If not, I hope that you will feel welcome and you'll stay with us. And uh, lots of kisses out to those regular viewers. You have no idea how much we appreciate you. And we've really had an interesting week so far because I've had the same guest Monday, Tuesday, and um, he will be with us today and also for the remainder of the week. And that's Pastor Willie Rice, who is the senior pastor of Calvary Church in Clearwater, Florida. And if you haven't joined us the last couple weeks, these programs will be on YouTube. I really hope that you will uh, look them up because I feel it's some of the most important information we've been able to impart to you uh, since we have come on the air. And that is uh, the rich, rich word out of the book of First Peter. And that's what we've been discussing and uh, how I believe it's just revolutionary to so many Christians in America today. And that is because of the word exiles. That's the name of the series that we are supposed to be as Christ followers, exiles in this wonderful, beautiful United States of America. And uh, Dr. Willie Rice has really uh, just explained that in such a wonderful way. And it's so important to the home because um, the children are going to mimic what the parents believe. And when you really understand that this is not your home, when you understand you will live differently and your children will pick that up. And so I'm delighted that um, Pastor Willie uh, made room for us in his schedule. And today he's going to again go through First uh, Peter and a lot of good things. And of course, Stephanie's here. We couldn't do this without her. And uh, we're going to make rich and creamy Parmesan mashed potatoes. Uh, we'll find out what the calories are. Maybe, maybe Stephanie's figured it out. So I'm going to join her. And following that, you will hear uh, this uh, segment for today on the subject of exiles. But again, I remind you, we are viewer supported and I love reading your mail. I can't tell you how much your words of encouragement mean to us. And uh, if you will support us, you can write to us at box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. Or uh, if you use your debit card or credit card, 1-800-229-0059. And I've joined Stephanie here. Don't you love the... Uh, email messages we get. Oh, I do so much. Just uh, I got one. I, I got a message on Facebook from Zambia the other day. They, from she, Zambia. Yeah, she missed a, a moist apple pie or moist apple cake recipe, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Is she so she's going to make that in Zambia. Yeah. yeah. How cool. Isn't that crazy. Yeah, and uh, we hear from young moms, and um, they're very appreciative. You're not the older, but I'm the older one teaching the younger you. woman. <laughs> As always my desire. <laughs> and uh, then we've got the grandmas out there. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so. We just, love hearing from you, really. We really do. And it's just reassuring. You, you come on here and you do yeah, all listen, this and you just don't know if you're really know? making. Yeah. And we are such a great contrast because I mentioned it before. I met my husband in church and you met yours in a bar. I and did. we're all saving the same <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Your story. Jesus is the same, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so sometimes we just like to bring recipes just to give you a little something, something for something you might make all the time and just to add a little pizzazz to it. Because and also, this could be that different dish you serve for your company. Mm -hmm. I, I like a dish mm -hmm. or something. You remember we did those flavored butters? Mm -hmm. Just make it yeah. a little bit different. Sometimes so, I get in a rut at home and I make the same thing over and over. And mm -hmm. there's like a million different recipes. Or you can just add just to something variation. that you have already. So we have potatoes Two that pounds. we put chicken broth in. And we just let the chicken broth um, Two pounds of red potatoes evaporate. with yep. uh, a can yep. of chicken broth. And that was it. That adds a, that another, looks looks good. Looks another so level of flavor. So and... I guess I just stand and look gorgeous while you do it. Do it. Okay. All right. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have some cream cheese here I'm going to put in. And that is, uh, the, that's a four ounce. Yes, four ounce. Not the big one. Although I have a feeling this is a lot more potatoes than... Um, well, it was two pounds. So. Was it really? Yeah. Okay. And oh, you know, I would probably why? do this with an electric mixer. 
Well, you could, but we don't like the sound of the electric mixer in the bowl on TV, so. <laughs> We're just trying to make Arthlane Rippy happy. It's and our it's goal. not easy. <laughs> so this is sour cream. So I'm just going to put this in. Yeah, I know when, um, like at Thanksgiving time, when I do do mashed potatoes, mm -hmm. which is about once a year or twice a year, I just whip and whip and whip and, oh, and just, um, so that they're just so smooth going down. Salt? My, um, my mother-in-law put evaporated milk in them. Oh, yeah. That, that really... Mm -hmm. uh, Makes them rich, but boy, this stuff. And this is a good workout, if nothing uh -huh. else. And this is Parmesan. Uh-huh. And you could use sharp. I love sharp cheddar in mashed mm -hmm. potatoes. You could put bacon bits. <laughs> yeah, and you know, this is, um, this is pretty simple to just change it up a little bit for your family. You yes. don't have to just do it when the company comes. Right, right. A little something different every, you know, so you don't get, I get stuck in these ruts. You're going to have more muscle on your right arm. I know. Arm. I'm going to have a big old muscle on my right arm. Okay, we're talking about calories and serving <laughs> sizes, okay? Yeah. Okay. Make sure your portion control is Well, in and this is why gear. Stephanie has a problem, okay? <laughs> because. Yeah. Because, okay. Let me get a spoon. Mm -hmm. They're saying a portion, okay, is this. Two-thirds of a cup. Oh. For like a baby, okay? <laughs> this right here has 199 calories. Okay? We just Stephanie's portion the whole is audience. like three times this. <laughs> so let's see. Let's see. That's, that's not, a serving. That's not Stephanie's portion. Gosh, right? no. That's why well, Stephanie that's has good. issues. Although that's not, that's a pretty big, big serving. Oh my. Is that so delicious? There are no words whatsoever. I think I'll serve these, you know, when we do Thanksgiving again. Mm. You're mm. going to taste it? No. Oh, come on. No. I'm good. I'm, I promise you that's the best mashed potato you'll ever put in your mouth. This is why I have problems. No. <laughs> She's so easily influenced. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> we don't lead you straight. Anyway, this is called um, That's heaven. Rich and Creamy Parmesan Mashed Potatoes, and, and we do not have the vocabulary to tell you how great really? they are. Really? It's an 11. But um, once again, we wow. are on this third segment with Pastor Willie. It's coming up right now. I think we're going to talk about the fact that the church has lost her strangeness. Be sure you listen carefully. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, just write to the address on your screen, or you can email your request to artheline at rippy.org. Well, I am glad to once again welcome uh, Pastor Willie Rice. I hope you've uh, seen the program in the last couple of days. Uh, he did a series on the first book of Peter, and it just grabbed me. I really believe with all of my heart that this is what the Church of America needs to hear today. So I asked him to come on, and um, actually we're giving you a brief uh, synopsis, but I'm, I know enough to make you think. And so uh, this is our third day, and we're going to talk about uh, how we're really supposed to be different, and that goes a little bit against the grain. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a Pentecostal preacher's daughter, mm -hmm. and uh, there were a lot of things that I couldn't, you know, be involved in. Right, <laughs> you can right, see how it right, scarred right. me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there is a natural tendency to want to blend in, and we're not right. Right. different than anybody else. But uh, on your on your uh, message that day, you pulled a hope you remember it, but you pulled a really interesting uh, thing from the movie Rocky, mm -hmm. which was very thought provoking. I mean, mm -hmm. what what a what a story. Well, it it is a, a story, and I, I'm not sure I remember the exact story. Uh -huh. Might refresh my memory there, but. Uh, um, the the idea of standing out, the idea of being different, is is. It's critical. We all want to blend in. You know, I think from middle school, you know, we, we remember it. We just, mm -hmm. we wanted to be picked on mm -hmm. the team. We wanted to be uh, uh, put in, uh, in the lineup. We all have this sense of, gosh, I want to fit in. But, um, but 
Jesus really calls us to stand up calls us to stand out and to be different. Mm -hmm. And and that's part of what it means to be a follower okay, of Okay, we'll go back to Rocky. Okay, it remind was, me. It was, I think, his the third Rocky movie or something, where he was very wealthy. That's exactly right. Thank yeah, you. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. can you take it yeah, from there? Yeah, yeah, it, You know, the series Rocky, the, uh -huh. you know, there's, I don't know how many movies they made. Wonderful story, you know, yeah. 10 or 11 or something. But <laughs> it was a great series, yeah. And as the as the series went on, I think it was by Rocky Three. he had become so... Uh, successful. He had won the championship. Mm -hmm. He had gone from being this outcast, this, you know, guy who lived in a slum, if you will, uh, to being, you know, wealthy, famous, beautiful wife, mm -hmm. mansion, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then he lost. And his trainer said, Rocky, the worst thing that could happen to a fighter happened to you. You became civilized. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in the American church, I think in a sense that's what happened. Uh, we, we were, you know, there was such success, there was such liberty, uh, such prosperity, that we just, we just became civilized. We became like the world around us, uh, so entrenched in the in the systems, in government, in business, in art, that we just blended in with the culture. And now, as the culture goes in a different direction, we we have a lot of American Christians who are going, "What do I do now?" You know, we feel betrayed, we feel abandoned. Mm -hmm. We grew up in a country that we loved and that loved us back. Now we are li find ourselves living in a country that we love, doesn't love us back anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it looks at what we believe of, as followers of Christ and finds it very strange mm -hmm. indeed. And I think that's gonna intensify. It's v absolutely gonna intensify. Yeah. Um, it's been several years ago that uh, George Barna wrote a book called The Second Coming of the Church. Mm -hmm. And he's our statistician, he's yes. our researcher. And he was comparing uh, the church with the world mm -hmm. uh, every way possible. Right, and, right, right. Including, you know, movies and TV and right. stuff. And that the Christian watched the same slop that mm -hmm. the world watched. And, and so, and kind of ended up there was no observable difference. You've seen that in just too many. Uh, Barna, of course, is a great researcher, and other researchers uh, have demonstrated that what we've seen, you know, in the last generation is just that that line is 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 not there anymore. There, there, there is, you know, similar propensities, whether it's to pornography or promiscuity or to other behaviors. There's just not a difference. And then, of course, some go to an extreme where it becomes very legalistic and prideful, and that's not what we're advocating either. Mm -hmm. What we're advocating is, and Peter talks about this throughout his book, it's one of his themes. It's, it's why he says in First Peter, quoting the Old Testament, be holy mm -hmm. as I am holy. He's saying to them, okay, you don't fit in here. You're not at home here. It's okay. You don't have to be at home here. Mm -hmm. Be like God. Be like Christ. That's where you fit in. That's where you want to belong. That's where you want your citizenship to be. And that's where the light comes from. Mm -hmm. I, I also heard uh, Dr. Blackaby talking about Barna's book. And he said, the problem is not with the darkness. Mm -hmm. The problem's with the light. <laughs> well, the light is, you know, uh, to contrast the darkness. And, mm -hmm. and again, to me, that's a, a hopeful picture mm -hmm. because... The light shines the brightest when it is the darkest. We, we don't, no one should interpret this conversation we're having or, uh, you know, a book like First Peter to cause us to be cynical or down. We should be emboldened. We should be courageous. We should be strong. What we, we won't be able to do in the next generation is be complacent and lukewarm. Mm -hmm. We won't survive. What's your thoughts about, I know you have this great Christian high school and thank God for it. What are your thoughts about just these young people growing up in this? This is their normal. It's My a new heart normal for us. Hurts for them. They're victims, you know, at this point in their life. I mean, we're all sinners, but but w they are growing up in a culture. Imagine it. Imagine it. they're growing up in a culture that has not taught them the truth about human sexuality. They they have been sold a bill of goods, and the the tragedy of that is. The shipwrecked lives, mm -hmm. the tragedy of that is is brokenness and shame and all kinds of devastation in terms of personal emotional state, in terms of even their physical life, in terms of relationships life. Imagine taking that precious sacred gift that God has created mm -hmm. and destroying it 
it, 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 it's, 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 it's a lie. And, and they have, so many of them just come into a culture where they have been swamped by that lie. Not all. Many of them, again, find the truth and are grounded in the truth. But if they are not being taught the truth, I promise you, every other exposure they are getting about life, and particularly about sexuality, is taking mm -hmm. them away from biblical truth. And it leads to such devastation. It leads if to it's not abortions, devastation. it's it's the poverty of single moms. The litany goes on and on. Yeah, yeah there's you're no, right. There's no there's no end to it. And how uh, the Apostle Peter, who is such an interesting character, <laughs> one of the, I would say one he was very great. obnoxious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we all knew one of you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, impulsive. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but with such unbelievable potential, and of course, right. God saw that, and and that sermon he preached on the day of Pentecost, right, uh, right. it's just brilliant. And and then he writes these thoughtful books. I have to say, uh, First and Second Peter are some of my favorites. They are. And he pushes holiness, and he pushes abstinence from the things against uh, God's law. But first, uh, first chapter of Second Peter gives me goosebumps mm -hmm. because he said his divine power mm. has given us everything we need right. perta pertaining to holiness. That's a good, yeah. yeah. What a great verse. And it has. And that's going to be the message that we need to train a new generation on. But that was written before Christian psychology and Absolutely. therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I think of the riches there that we don't tap into, right. His divine power. Right. Well, you're, you're exactly right. And, I mean, that comes, again, from being rooted in the gospel and rooted in, in the holiness of Christ, living for Him, living for His kingdom, we've lost our power when we try to accommodate the mm -hmm. culture around us. It bleeds into so many areas. It wasn't too long ago I was in the grocery store and paid for my groceries, and when I got out to my car, I realized I hadn't paid for a gallon of water. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, put my stuff in the car, and I started back, and this gal said, can I have your card? And I said, Yes, if you don't mind returning this water because I didn't pay for it. She says, well, you got out here with it. <laughs> and I think that's the norm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it certainly, you know, when you work with young people, again, the, the encouraging thing is what you are seeing is some Christian young people who are some of the brightest, most committed because they've had to think these things through. And if they get grounded and on fire, this is, there is, to me, great hope. Uh, we're seeing record numbers in some of our seminaries and colleges, and these young people are, I mean, they're strong as battery acid. They are grounded. They are on fire. But, but I think it's simply because of what you just said. They've come up in a culture where it's not normal it's not to working. follow Jesus. Yeah. So you can't just follow Jesus mm -hmm. with the crowd. You have to make a break with the crowd to mm -hmm. be a follower of Christ. So those who do, they're radical. They're committed. They're all in. But for so much of the culture, the, the, you know, the Judeo-Christian ethic that once was just a part of education isn't there. Well, maybe also uh, materialism doesn't impress them that much. No, it really doesn't. Um, they're not impressed by that. They, they, I think they've seen how empty it is. They've seen how empty it is. And, uh, and you know, they challenge us as church leaders, mm -hmm. which is a good, it's a good challenge um, to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're using the money that's given to advance the gospel, to advance the kingdom. They're not going to be, they're not that impressed with a fancy building. Uh, they're not going to be drawn to churches just because of superficial stuff. That, that day's gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I mean, we got a coffee shop in our church. You can put a coffee shop in your church. That's good. I'm glad we have a coffee shop in the church. But I want to tell you this millennial generation, they're not going to come to your church because you got a cool coffee shop. That's refreshing. Uh, uh, they're, you know, they're coming to church because you're preaching the gospel and you're grounding them in the gospel or they're not coming because they can go to a coffee mm -hmm. shop. So, again, I'm all for coffee shops. Mm -hmm. But the question is, when you get in there, what are you giving them? And, and they are looking for sustenance. They're looking for biblical teaching. They're looking for a grounded faith. Well, as an old church person, I believe about everything descends from the pulpit. And uh, messages like exiles and uh, what Peter was talking about, they need to come from the, more than just, um, you know, do your best. Right. Um, I think it's uh, very important, and I, I think a lot of um, Peter was talking about 
your conduct mm -hmm. and the way you behave yourself. But we're living in a culture that says go with the flow and do what you feel and and all and it, this. It isn't just do the right thing because it's the right thing no, and oh, make no, you no. a better person. <laughs> and it is why. It is that they were, again, going back to the message of Peter, you know, they were part of an eternal kingdom. Mm -hmm. They understood the gospel. They understood the why of their behavior. And that's what motivated them to be different. If we just tell our kids, hey, be different because it's what you ought to do, mm -hmm. that, that, that isn't going to work. They need more. They need, they need to be grounded in the gospel. Um, in looking at, uh, at Peter's life, and what an unbelievable uh, story he has, that he would end up with these kind of books. Did, right. did that kind of surprise you? Well, it again shows the power of Christ. But you see, you know, when you think of, um, because you think of Peter as this rough, uh -huh. impulsive fisherman. Fisherman, yeah. But when you, when you hear him writing about, you know, the foundation, we're the people of God, uh, you know, you, you go back in your mind to what Jesus talked to him about, you know, on this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You, you hear Christ calling him to, to uh, fish for men, to feed my sheep. And I, I just think the transformative power of Christ through his life, and, and, and now you see it fleshed out as an older man, as a mm -hmm. great leader, and probably encouraging some Christians who are disillusioned, like, why, why is this so hard? And he's writing to them, you're exiles. Mm -hmm. You're not home yet. What was, what was the situation they were living in? They had been scattered. I mean, he, he's writing uh, to exiles scattered throughout. And by the time he's writing, there had been Christians uh, and some Jewish Christians, also Gentile Christians. But they had been scattered throughout much of the Roman Empire. And they were beginning to experience you know, a measure of persecution. The intense waves of persecution maybe hadn't started yet that we've read about in history. Mm -hmm. That would eventually take Peter's own life. But they were being ostracized by society. They were being, uh, they were being you know, relegated to the margins, and it was, it was hard for them. And so I think he was encouraging them. You're exiles. It's, it's, it, you're not supposed to feel at home here. You're exiles. And that's a message for America. Absolutely. Although we're probably more comfortable. But when you see across the world these millions of exiles mm -hmm. trying to get trying to get to a safe place, and that's only going to accelerate. Right. Well, th there really are exiles in the yeah. world, and and we need to, and th those are not easy solutions to solve. No one should think that it's an easy solution to solve. Uh, but since you raised it, I, I do hope. Uh, you know, that as Christians think through those issues, we don't yeah. just think through it from a political prism of a knee jerk, I'm, this party says this and that, that. We need to try to have the mind of Christ. Certainly we need, you know, laws and... and, and it's huge. But we also need compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember in the Bible, you know, it, it talked about being kind to the strangers and the aliens and the exiles because you yourself mm -hmm. were one. God said that to his people in the Old Testament. So I, I just hope as we think through, those are complex issues. Let's, let's be careful our attitudes are biblical more than they are just political. Well, I hate to be morbid, but in the Middle East, ISIS is cutting off the heads of yep. Christians and their great prize would be to cut off the heads of Christians in America. Mm -hmm. And that we need to get very strong in the Lord and the power of His might mm -hmm. and just well, get ready for a ride. Am I getting a little bumpy? No, yeah, it, well, it might. I think there is a, a, a challenging time, and I think there is a lot of American theology that taught Christians in America that God was going to spare us from any difficulty, from any tribulation. I won't veer into the eschatological discussions, but a lot of our theology reinforce this idea that we're not going to experience trouble in this world. The Bible says exactly the opposite. <laughs> Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Again, we should be full of great joy and great hope because we know how the story ends. But we should also be prepared for great difficulty and trouble in this world. I hope it certainly doesn't come to what we're seeing in the Middle East, but you and I have Christian brothers and sisters who, as you and I are having this conversation, their very lives are being taken, their very lives are being threatened, oh. and they, Christ mm. loves them like He loves us. They are the body of Christ. We need to be remembered to pray for them, to pray for them to be strengthened, and it's just a reminder we need to be strong as well. I know, and uh, our congregations need to know these things. They really do. Uh, to me, it's a sense of security mm -hmm. to, know, to know the Scripture. 
You're not going to be shocked. Yeah. Um, on, you know, to me, uh, you cleared up a lot of things about in First Peter that I've read through many times, because he seems to just <laughs> go all over the map. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're going to visit one of those on the next programs when all of a sudden Noah appears. I've yep. read that scripture so many <laughs> times. I well, what's he doing here? Yeah, you know. Yeah, so you yeah. can explain to us. Stay with me. I have a couple things to say before we have to say goodbye. Arthelene would like you to keep the following information handy. You may contact Homekeepers by writing to Homekeepers, P.O. Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758, or go to www.rippy.org. Remember, we always enjoy hearing from our viewers, and we thank you for your support. I have a feeling that you're getting an awful lot of these uh, <coughs> conversations with Pastor Willie Rice, and he is the lead pastor at Calvary Church in Clearwater, Florida, a church that is just booming. They have a wonderful high school. And as we mentioned, I believe, on the uh, Monday of this week, um, they have been celebrating 150 years, which I think is very, very special, and uh, God's blessing is on them. But the important thing is the, the messages we've been getting that I think are so, so important to the home. And it, it gives you a compass. It gives you <clears throat> some kind of a, a roadmap when we live in this confusion and confusion. And as we've mentioned, we're in a big time of uh, political season and all. And there's voices from every side. But when you know the truth, there's something that can be very calm within the very, very center of your being. I hope that you will absolutely not miss uh, the next program. As mentioned, we'll be talking about that wonderful, wonderful character, Noah. And when you think about in that day and time when the Holy Spirit was not evident as today, uh, he believed God and he trusted God and he obeyed God. That is the timeless, timeless message for Christians anywhere in the United States or around the world, if you can get those three things just deeply embedded in your own soul and your own life, it's going to make a difference. So don't miss it on the next program. And I'll be here and I want to remind you there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN programs and then on homekeepers. 